I got a comment from some people saying to me that how could I write a book like Stop Simping, Why Men Don't Need Finance to Get Romance, when I've not been in a relationship for 25 years? Well, I believe that really is what makes me qualified to write a book like Stop Simping, Why Men Don't Need Finance to Get Romance, because I am approaching the subject matter from an objective view. And when you approach subject matter from an objective view, you are approaching it from a fair and balanced perspective. You have no biases, you have no personal opinions involved, you have no emotions involved. And because you have no emotions involved and no personal interest in it, you can approach the subject matter in the most fair and balanced fashion and provide information to people that allows them to learn the most about the subject. And because I approach the subject matter of simps in that constructive manner, I believe that my book is one of the best in helping people understand what this simp paradigm is and how it leads to people having their lives fall apart. And I've gotten, you know, a lot of positive feedback on Stop Simping, why men don't need finance to get romance from both men and women all over the world. And those people have read the book and they have come out of it learning more about this dysfunctional life paradigm and how it prevents you from living the best life possible and prevents you from having healthy and functional relationships. Um, I, have, I actually have some experience with simps, but it's from a different perspective. Now, back when I was in junior high school, I dealt with a lot of men who, or boys, people would consider simps. I saw the beginnings of this behavior way back in junior high school when I was 12 years old, and it raised the red flag black then. And as I began doing more research on these nice guys, you know, I began to go back and think about those experiences. And I began to understand, you know, where a lot of this behavior come from. Because back when I was 12 years old, I remember being in a gym class and I wasn't prepared for class. I was sitting in the bleachers. And one guy decides to talk to me. And he said, the first thing that comes out of his mouth is, do you have a girlfriend? And I found that question to be quite peculiar because... What boy asks another boy if he has a girlfriend? You would think that another boy would ask a boy if he, what type of video games he plays, what types of comic books does he read, what type of cartoons does he watch, what type of shows does he watch. Those are subjects that other boys ask other boys who they don't know. They don't start the, the conversation off with something regarding sex or sexuality unless they are feeling insecure. And this is what I saw, you know, quite a bit in my interpersonal relationships, especially with black and Hispanic males. This is how they have con this is how they start off conversations because it shows, you know, how insecure they are because a lot of these males, they have overly close relationships to their mothers. And because they have overly close relationships to their mothers, they're always looking for someone who's going to go out here and look to appease, as I call it, the queen, or please the queen. And when they see a man radiating, or a boy radiating masculine energy, who is secure in himself, who is comfortable in himself, and is not looking for the attention or approval of others, it makes them uncomfortable. So they have to, act, so they have to bring the conversation into the gutter and start talking about sex, because they cannot relate to a person like myself on any other level. They have, they, they know on an instinctive level, they have nothing in common. So they have to bring everything into the sewer, as I call it. This is where the, this is what the simp does. So he's going to start asking you if you have a girlfriend. They know, you know, that they can't relate to you on any other level. And my mistake was saying no to this individual. And this is what they do. The simp, when he sees that you're not looking to please and appease women, he goes into his paradox trap, um, where he tries to use this to launch into his shaming language. And as long as you play his game, you're going to lose. As long as you feel inadequate in front of this person, you're going to lose. And I ran into a lot of these simps, you know, back in junior high school. And as I got older, I ran into more, you know, of these simps. And they would always try to bring the conversation towards the sexual and they would always try to make everything about women. They were everything because they, they don't like the idea of a man who can focus on himself, 
focus on the goals he wants to pursue. Everything with them is about pleasing and appeasing women, chasing women, seeking the approval of women, and seeing a man who can go out here and, you know, pursue his own goals, hobbies, and interests, that makes these men feel very inadequate. Because, again, they live for the pleasing and pleasing of women. They live for the approval of women. And that makes them very upset. And sadly, when you're in a school with where simps outnumber you seven to one, it can lead to a very, very hostile environment. And these guys, again, they very much act like women. They're very cliquish. They're very catty. They take things very personal. Um, they love to argue and they love to have a lot of drama. They do a lot of passive-aggressive things like stealing your stuff and then um, watching you scramble and look around for it and then saying that, oh, I don't know what happened to it. They do all sorts of dysfunctional things. And when it comes down to these males, you know, they, they, they're, they're, they're a nightmare to deal with because, again, they're, they're just like dealing with a woman. They, they, they're, they're, they're a literal nightmare to deal with. Everyone has to agree with them. Their opinion is the only opinion. And if you have an opinion of your own, these guys want to fight you. If you, do, if you don't want to do things their way, they want to fight you. they always looking for... It's, like, it's, it's just, again, it's just like dealing with a very, very menstrual woman. A woman who is on her period. And you eventually just get tired of dealing with those guys. And I had to deal with a lot of these guys. And they, were, they, would, they would just... They would, they, would, they would make life a nightmare. And these guys, they spend more... They were more concerned with my my romantic life than I was. I didn't care, really. I was more into my comics, um, you know, video games, TV shows. These guys would be like, when, these guys would just continuously harass me. When are you going to get a girlfriend? When are you going to get a girlfriend? When are you going to sleep with someone? It's, it, it just got, it's really, it was really sad to deal with. And then on the flip side, when I was dealing with these, with the females in my, you know, South Bronx area, um, I had to deal with a whole host of really, really dysfunctional females. And as I grew older and, you know, and I started to see how a lot of these females behaved, you know, I began to see, you know, it, it's better for me to leave these chicks alone. But a lot of these guys, you know, they don't understand, they don't see, they didn't see things from my perspective. They didn't understand that many of the females that, were gro that I was growing, we were growing up with, were eventually going to become predators because the behavior that they learned from their mothers was, you know, how to use men as tools. And they saw men basically as someone that they could use to get from point A to point B or someone to be a sperm donor so that they could get a welfare case or an SSI case. But a lot of these guys, again, they're not very smart, so they couldn't see, you know, how these women were going to use them. Now, I've had, I had women approach me. Um, back in junior high school and high school, and I was interested in some of them until I started listening to what they really had to say with a critical ear. And I remember one conversation I had that pretty much, you know, gave me my views on women today. And it was this female, you know, back in high school, came up to me, said that she liked me, and I didn't pay much attention to it because, again, I was focused on myself and my comics and my you know, hobbies, and then a couple of days later, I'm listening to her, and she says that she feels sorry for me, and I correlated that with something my mother said about my father. Now, my mother said she got involved with my father because she felt sorry for him, and that made me look at women and say, a lot of these women have no respect for a black man, and when I looked at that, I said, if, so, if you can't have respect for me, we can't have a relationship. That was something I said you know, back when I was about 15 years old, and I said to my, I said that to myself, you know, and I've stayed with that ever since. I said, if you don't have any respect, you can't have any foundation for a relationship. And a lot of these guys, that, that just goes right over their head. So they don't understand that if you don't have any respect, you have nothing. And a woman who does not respect you is pretty much, you know, this is the type of chick who will set you up for a murder or set you up for a robbery. And then say that, stand right there and act like nothing has happened. And when I, all the other thing that, you know, gave me some experience about simps, you know, back then was, you know, watching a lot of these guys getting used. I mean, a lot of these guys, a lot of these women were getting involved with these dope dealers. A lot of them were getting involved with these gang members. A lot of them were getting around with these, um, 
thugs back in the late 80s, and I saw that what who they were choosing, and I said, if she's choosing to get involved with these type of guys, then and I want to have a certain quality of life, I'm not going to be able to have that quality of life with her, because she basically wants this type of man, and I'm not that type of man, then I need to go out here and pursue women who want to have the same type of quality of life. Unfortunately, because I live in the South Bronx, those type, that type of quality woman is not available. So it's better for me to just stay to myself rather than get involved with one of these dysfunctional females. Now, a lot of these guys don't know how dysfunctional these females are out here because they are still caught up in the emotion. They are still intoxicated by that 66 rear end, six inch rear end and those double D's and that toxic nuclear waste facility that is ruminating between her legs. They, they, they're, they're caught up in all that. So they don't see her from a critical perspective. When I look at a lot of those women here in the South Bronx back in the day, and I still, you know, sometimes look at them, um, they're not anyone you would consider for a serious relationship. They're not somebody who you would even consider dating. A lot of them are pretty much, they're either, the, back then, back in the 80s, I said to myself, a lot of these women are on their way to becoming single mothers or baby mamas. They're not someone you would want to have a relationship. You can't even relate to them on any sort of level. They don't know how to have a conversation about anything. Um, they don't know how to do anything. They have no sense of humor. They have no personality. All they can talk about are silly things like sneakers and celebrities. And I was a guy sitting here, I was reading comic books, I was reading novels, um, I was reading newspaper articles, and I wanted to have, you know, intelligent conversation. You can't have intelligent conversation with some of these females out here. So I decided to leave them alone. I said, look, this person is, is headed down one road, you know, and I'm headed down this road. I want this type of quality of life for myself. So I'm not going to get involved, you know, with this type of person. It's just smarter for me to stay to myself until I can deal with people on another level when it comes down but the simp you know all he's thinking of with is his penis and all he's thinking about is getting laid and because he thinks on that level he often winds up you know being taken advantage of by predators being used by predators and wind up you know being either dumped to the curb um by a predatory female or being put on the hook for child support for the next 18 years of his life and these guys, again, they can't think past what's past their penis. They can't think past that. And because they can't think past their penis, they wind up in the worst situations. And I look at those type of guys, and it just makes me, it just it just saddens me because some of these guys, again, they grew up in these single mother households. They never understood, you know, what manhood is. They never understood what masculinity is. And they never understood, you know, how to conduct themselves as men. They, and the sad part is a lot of them, they grew up with this whole nice guy paradigm because, again, a lot of men grew up who grew up since the late 60s into the to, to today grew up in the age of feminism. And because they grew up in the age of feminism, they wound up learning how to appease and please women instead of learning what natural masculinity is. Now, I'm not the greatest. Again, I grew up in a single mother household. But there were other men in my life. I mean, I did see my father once a week. I did have an older brother who taught me a lot about manhood and a lot about masculinity. And he was a great role model for me in learning what being a man was about. And because I had, you know, male figures in my life, I was able to, you know, get a semblance of what it meant to be a man. And as I began, you know, doing research on nice guys, I began to learn more and more you know, about men and masculinity and the male identity. And one of the things that, you know, I picked up from Dr. Glover, was, Dr. Robert Glover, the author of No More Mr. Nice Guy, was to, for a man to start reconnecting with his masculinity, was to start, you know, dealing with other men. That's one of the things I did with social media is I started reconnecting with other men and getting a perspective on manhood. And that really, you know, started things rolling for me. And as I got into that, you know, I started learning about more and more about nice guys. I started again um, with that article way back in 2003, and then from there, just doing the research and learning more. And as I felt, as I as I started, you know, learning more about these simps and learning more about these nice guys and learning more about their approaches, um, 
you know, I decided, you know, I was a friend of mine, my author friend, my best-selling author friend said to me, you know, you're really doing good work on these blogs. You need to write a nonfiction book. So I decided, you know, I really wanted to write a nonfiction book. So I decided, okay, I will. I first, the first book ebook I did was called uh, something about the comic book industry. I did a couple of, you know, small ones. But I decided, you know, I really want to help men out. So I decided to write the first stop simping. Now the first stop simping was basically a couple of my blogs mixed in with some new content and it, it really took off and it helped a lot of men and as I you know did my more and more research into this nice guy paradigm and the simp paradigm um, I wound up writing the Manginus book and when I did the Manginus book you know everything really exploded. That's, that's when I really started to connect with men all over the world and that was a book that I, I did a little bit more research on but as I did these simp books you know I did more and more research and I said to myself you know if you're gonna write a serious book about simping because um I, I when I write I, after I did the Manginas and Misadventures of Captain Sable that's when I really you know went back to further my research um I went and said you know if you're gonna really write this stuff you really have to come from facts you really just can't come you know straight from opinion you have to have, you know, facts to back up everything. And that's something that a good quality nonfiction book has. A writer just does not come from their personal experience. Again, they have to remain extremely objective um, so that they can take a look at those facts and, you know, correlate them and make them connect in a constructive manner that so that the reader can see where all the dots connect um, towards the argument. So that's why I believe I could write Stop Simping because I was coming at it not just from my personal experience but from the experience of studying and researching this subject for over 10 years having numerous sources to reinforce my arguments from licensed psychotherapists, professional relationship experts, um, numerous men numerous women and I believe that's what makes the Stop Simpin book you know extremely fair and balanced and presents you know the most balanced picture and I also use other sources like Elliot Rogers Manifesto now Elliot Rogers Manifesto was a tremendous resource in the second edition of Stop Simpin um, that, that, that document has a wealth of information which takes us inside the head of a simp helps us understand how these simps think and their approaches. And when I read that manifesto and I took it back to Dr. Robert Glover's No More Mr. Nice Guy, um, I saw a lot of the same behaviors he discussed in his book and in his psychotherapy. And I went back to Dr. Glover's website and even he saw the same behaviors in Elliot Roger. So I knew I was on the right track because if you have Dr. Glover, a licensed psychotherapist, saying the exact same things, you know, about this guy, because after I saw the Elliot Roger massacre, I, I started looking at the patterns, and I said, this is a simp. I just, I just knew it, you know, from just listening to the arguments presented. And when I saw the Chris Harper Mercer murder and all these other murders out here, I saw the exact same thing, and it correlated with the research, followed the pattern and the profile of the nice guy simp, and... That's where, you know, I, that's what I took many of my sources from. I don't, you know, just write a book like your Stop Simping. I mean, I believe that if you're going to write a nonfiction book, it should be the best quality possible. And you should have an understanding of your material. You should be able to present that material from an objective perspective. And you should be able to present it in a way that is comprehensive so that the reader gets an understanding of the subject matter, gets an understanding of why these approaches and patterns don't work, and an understanding of what the solution is. That's what a quality nonfiction book um, presents to the reader. Not like your Steve Harvey, act like a lady, think like a man. Yes, that book was popular. Yes, it was entertaining. Yes, it made people feel. But a good quality nonfiction book makes the reader think. It gives them an understanding of the subject matter and they come out of it learning something and that's what I wanted men to do with Stop Simping why men don't need finance to get romance I wanted them to come to an understanding about why this pattern of behavior is destructive why these approaches are destructive 
why these approaches don't work and what they can do to you know move their lives forward and to grow past you know this destructive life paradigm that's what I wanted men to do with this stop simp and why men don't need finance to get romance I wanted them to come out of it learning how this you know how this um, way of thinking can't where it came from how they how they what what it's how it's destructive and how what they can do you know to break free of this pattern I mean that's what a good again nonfiction book does it gives you solutions and I believe Stop Simpin gives a lot of guys solutions because I've heard the feedback from men all over the world who have read you know the three books in the Simp trilogy and they have told me that you know this book really has helped me and this is the type of book you should give you know a teenage boy or a young boy so he can understand you know how relationships really work how to have relationships with women and how to have relationships with people um, because a lot of guys are not getting this type of information they're not getting it because again there are no fathers in their lives there are no men you know in their lives and they are not learning you know how to deal with social situations regarding women they're learning it because again they have that too close attachment to their mother they're learning this from a female perspective and this is why those guys were acting just like the ones I ran into back in IS 148 when I was 12 years old they coming at everything from a female perspective they're thinking that you know you have social relationships with people from a female perspective and they're thinking that you know it's appropriate for a man to ask another man if he has a girlfriend they're thinking it's appropriate for another man to hook up another man with a woman these are not masculine behaviors these are effeminate behaviors because a masculine a man you know it's simple as this a man a woman looks at a man a man looks at her they introduce themselves simple as that is it, it's not you know rocket science there is no men do not need to bully other men into relationships men do not pressure other men in their relationships again that's feminine behavior mask men you know they simply just are who they are and if women are attracted to them or interested in them they approach them that's simple as that and if they see something they like then that's how it goes but you know because a lot of men were never raised to understand you know the natural approach to relationships or come to an understanding about it they go out here thinking that they have to please and appease women and they wind up you know behind the eight ball because again women are looking for men who are going to be leaders they're looking for someone to follow they're not looking for a man who's going to follow behind her and any woman you know who a man is following behind um, you know any woman who follow who has a man following behind her she's not going to respect because women do not respect simps and the simple reason why they don't respect them is because this man is in the follower position and she's looking for him to lead and if this man cannot lead himself then there's nothing for her to respect or appreciate because without respect there is no cooperation and without respect and cooperation there can be no love or no trust or any foundation for a relationship basically the only women who are attracted to your simp are tools I mean are predators and predators use men as tools and they take advantage of these guys and the sad part is many of these guys you know go to their grave following this simp paradigm and never coming to an understanding that the way they're living you know is destroying them and that there's a better way out here for them and that if they follow this new paradigm they can just take their lives to the next level that's all I have to say for this video you can comment rate and subscribe